I'm going to talk this morning about work that uh, David Button has been leading, uh, working as a postdoc in my research group over the last year. Um, he's not here to give this talk himself this morning because he's just started a new postdoc in North Carolina. So he's busy settling in there at the moment. So we know that mass extinctions have played a profound influence, uh, have had a profound influence on the evolution of life. They've done this through reducing diversity, through restructuring ecosystems, but also through fundamentally altering and reshaping the, the biogeographic distribution of organisms. So we've long recognized uh, five major mass extinction events spread across the Phanerozoic. And today I'm going to talk about two of these. Um, the mass extinction that occurred at the end of the Permian about 252 million years ago, and the mass extinction at the end of the Triassic about two, 200 million years ago. So these two mass extinction events are separated by the 50 million years of the Triassic period. And from a biogeographical point of view, this is a, an interesting period of Earth history due to the presence of the supercontinent Pangaea, uh, which only began to break up about at the end of the, 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 the Triassic as the Atlantic Ocean started to form. So we might perceive that on a supercontinent there should be relatively few barriers to dispersal due to the absence of oceanic barriers. And we might expect uh, to have a relatively cosmopolitan uh, flora and fauna. Um, that's been suggested for at least some parts of the Triassic, but actually some of the work that's been done previously on terrestrial vertebrate uh, biogeography during the Triassic has suggested that at least during the late Triassic, uh, terrestrial vertebrate faunas were surprisingly endemic. And this might have been driven by perhaps very strong climatic variation. Triassic is also import an important interval uh, because it records a major faunal transition among terrestrial vertebrates. So we go from late Permian uh, ecosystems which are dominated by synapsids like Gorgonopsians and uh, Dicynodonts to ecosystems by the end of the Triassic that are overwhelmingly dominated by archosaurs, uh, by dinosaurs, pterosaurs, crocodilomorphs and their kin. So we see a really a, a fundamental shift in the kind of the, the dominant groups of terrestrial vertebrates through the Triassic. It's also the interval in which we see the origins of many of the groups which, which shape uh, Mesozoic ecosystems and remain very important today. So we see the first mammals, the first turtles, the first lepidosauromorphs and so on. Now generalization that's often made about mass extinctions is that they are followed by um, relatively depauperate but relatively globally homogenous and cosmopolitan faunas, what we refer to as disaster faunas, dominated by uh, disaster taxes. So they tend to be very uneven but relatively short-lived uh, faunas. And this has been suggested to be particularly the case for the Permo-Triassic of mass extinction. So we have these diverse late Permian marine ecosystems, which were replaced in the very early part of the, the early Triassic by these relatively depauperate, uh, relatively cosmopolitan uh, marine faunas. And this has also been suggested to be the case for uh, terrestrial vertebrates. Um, so if you go anywhere in the world in the earliest part of the Triassic and you're looking at terrestrial rocks, you're going to find remains of the Dicynodont Lystrosaurus. And there are a number, a number of other uh, taxa, such as Proterosuchus and, and Procolophon, which are also kind of viewed as classic uh, disaster taxa. So very abundant but short-lived in the aftermath of this, the, the Permo-Triassic mass extinction. And this pattern has been suggested for other mass extinction events, uh, including the Triassic-Jurassic uh, Triassic mass extinction. But it's actually been re relatively rarely tested, particularly in a qu quantitative framework. So. One of, the, um, uh, one of the authors who has attempted to quantitatively look at patterns of cosmopolitanism across mass extinctions or across a mass extinction for terrestrial vertebrates was Chris Cedor and colleagues uh, back in 2013. They looked at biogeographic patterns uh, in southern Pangaea across the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, looking at terrestrial vertebrate faunas. So they looked at terrestrial vertebrate faunas from the, the, the late part of the Permian and also from the kind of the, the early to middle Triassic boundary, so somewhere around here. And they use a, a novel net, network biogeography approach. And in this approach, uh, essentially what you do is you um, define a set of biogeographic areas, which are uh, nodes within a network, so they're the, the red circles here. And then taxa represent links between those biogeographic areas. So where taxa are shared between different areas, they form a link within the network. And you can then basically look at the density of that network. So how many links are there present between areas in that network relative to the kind of theoretical maximum number of links that could be present. And the more links that are present, the, the, the denser the network, the, the higher the bi biogeographic connectivity, and the more cosmopolitan your fauna. 
So when they applied this to, um, to their Permo Triassic data set, um, they found that actually in the Permian they had a relatively cosmopolitan fauna with lots of shared taxa between different areas. But surprisingly, in the, the, the kind of the early part of the Middle Triassic, they had a much more endemic fauna. So perhaps the opposite of what you might, uh, might or, or people have suggested classically is the case across the Permo Triassic mass extinction. Now there are a number of limitations to this study, so it was focused only on a relatively small area of southern Pangaea. It didn't incorporate phylogeny, so it didn't incorporate any information on evolution, evolutionary relationships, so it's just looking for shared species. Uh, and as a result, I would suggest it's quite sensitive to things like um, taxonomic splitting or lumping, uh, or minor differences, or relatively small differences in the stratigraphic age of localities. So, with this in mind, we've been at attempting to build upon Chris Seedor's work uh, and address a number of key hypotheses. So, we're interested in testing this idea that both the Permo-Triassic and the Tri Triassic-Jurassic mass extinctions led to increases in global cosmopolitanism. We want to see if those increases, if they exist, are driven by the development of disaster faunas. And then we're also interested in looking at how that uh, cosmopolitanism changes through time. Does it decay through time? So it's been suggested, as I mentioned earlier, that late Triassic uh, faunas were very endemic. So how does um, cosmopolitanism decay through the, um, through the Triassic as endemism builds up? To do this, we've been looking at um, uh, data primarily from the Paleobiology database. So this is data that we've, uh, we've been keen in, in putting into the database in the first place and making sure that it's, uh, it's of the best quality that can be. Um, we've extracted data for uh, close to 900 species, uh, representing more than 2,000 occurrences. And these span the, the Lepingian to early Jurassic. So we're, we're looking at a time period of about 90 million years here. We've also put together an informal super tree of early amniotes. Um, so this has slightly more species uh, than the, uh, the uh, data set that we've downloaded from the Paleobiology database. Uh, we've included older species in order to allow us to timescale this tree correctly. For, any bio, or for most bi biogeographic analyses, you have to define um, biogeographic areas. Um, now, classically, people have done this using modern continental areas, so using areas like Africa, North America, South America, and so on. This is problematic on a supercontinent because an area in... Um, Kind of the eastern US up here uh, is actually much closer to uh, uh, kind of North Africa, uh, somewhere like Morocco, uh, than it is to kind of southwest, uh, uh, southwest USA. And that's even more striking if you look at the difference between kind of southern Africa down here and Morocco up here. So instead of uh, kind of using modern areas, we've defined novel biogeographic areas using uh, cluster analysis using the paleo, paleo coordinate data from the paleobiology database. And when we do that, we, um, we come up with a series of, of novel biogeographic areas that perhaps make more sense in the context of Pangaea. So, for example, uh, eastern North America is grouped in with Morocco and Algeria. So those are the areas that we're using for the biogeographical analyses. We've developed a novel phylogenetic modification of the uh, biogeographic connectedness approach. So the classic approach, uh, as I've already explained briefly, you define your biogeographic areas, which represent the nodes within the network. So these are these large um, kind of brownish circles here. And then taxa, which are the smaller circles, represent or oh, potentially form links between those, those, those different areas that you've defined. So in this case, we've got a taxon, which is uh, the, the represented by a yellow circle, which is present in all three of the areas and is forming links between those areas. And you look at the, the, the density of that, ne that, that, that network. In the phylogenetic approach, um, we basically uh, include extra links. So we, we, we look at the phylogenetic distance between taxa, and we weight links between those taxa according to the phylogenetic distance. So we're able to incorporate a lot more information. And essentially, we, we then quantify the, the density of the network in the same way. But we're looking at essentially the, kind of the phylogenetic distance between localities. So when phylogenetic uh, connectedness is high, we have um, a more cosmopolitan fauna, uh, with, with more shared links, uh, so phylogenetically, the, the localities are, are closer to one another phylogenetically. And when we have low phylogenetic uh, connectedness, then we're looking at a more in, endemic fauna. So we've applied this to our data set from the, 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 the late Permian through to the early Jurassic. We've divided it up into a number of different time slices here. Uh, so on this plot, we've got um, phylogenetic uh, connectedness shown in, in blue with the, uh, the error margins. And then the aphylogenetic approach that Cedar and colleagues developed is shown in red. And you can immediately see that we can get more signal 
out of this data by using the, the, the phylogenetic um, approach. So we have a relatively flat um, a result when we just use the aphylogenetic approach, but by incorporating uh, phylogeny we're able to get much more signal here. There are two main uh, results that I just want to draw your attention to. One is that we do see major increases in cosmopolitanism across both of the extinction events. So we see a significant increase across the Permian-Triassic event with very high cosmopolitanism in the earliest Triassic. And we see the same across the, um, the Triassic-Jurassic event with cosmopolitanism again being higher, uh, significantly higher in the earliest Jurassic than in the latest Triassic. We also see a general pattern of uh, reductions in cosmopolitanism through time. So we start out in the early, early Triassic with this very cosmopolitan fauna and that decays through the Triassic as endemism builds up and we have very high levels of endemism in the, in the late Triassic. So this is um, consistent with, with the classic observation or cl classic qualitative observation of increases in cosmopolitanism across mass extinction events. Um, but it could be this pattern could be generated by a number of different um, uh, uh, mechanisms. So one, one mechanism is a uh, disaster fauna with taxa uh, radiating in the aftermath of the extinction. But it's also possible that you could have this pattern as a result of the preferential extinction of geographically restricted taxa. So we wanted to test that by looking at some subset analyses. So we've done two subset analyses um, looking at different partitions of our data. The first of these basically looks at clades which cross through the mass extinction and have relatively high survivorship. So this should remove the influence of, um, of the possibility that the signal is driven by the preferential extinction of geographically restricted clades. We've also looked at uh, clades that originate either at or immediately after the extinction event. Um, so those are the clades that we might classically think would be acting as disaster taxa. And when we do that partitioned analysis, the key pattern here really is that the highest biogeographic, uh, biogeographic connectivity is always for these novel clades, uh, which originate either at or immediately after the extinction. Um, so we see significantly uh, higher values for those clades uh, in, cr across both of these extinction events. And that is completely consistent with the idea of um, this increase in cosmopolitanism being driven by the development of a disaster fauna. So tax are radiating in response to the extinction event. So just to sum up, um, by including the phylogenetic information, we're able to extract a lot more um, uh, data or a lot more signal out of these uh, uh, models of network connectivity. We do find an increase in cosmopolitanism across both of these mass extinction events. And this seems to be driven by the development of a, a relatively globally homogenous disaster fauna in both cases. And then we see through the Triassic, we see the, the kind of the, the build-up of faunal provinciality through time as endemism uh, builds up and this cosmopolitanism decays into the late Triassic. Okay, thank you very much. And if I've got time, I'm happy to take questions.